in America, how we develop in the last 80 years is completely 100% wrong. The process of segregation in America is really directly tied to residential construction. We started putting people into buckets in their neighborhoods that were all alike. I'm wealthier than you, so I can live in this gated community. You have to live over here in this little trailer park. I mean, that's how it's always been. The individual that makes $11,000 to the individual that makes a million dollars a year, somebody has something to contribute. There's something that that person knows that you don't. No matter what you say, you're never going to have a united America. It's always going to be divided. I think people are hungry for what's next and to see if there's something better beyond what we've all been taught. Usually there is. Certain things are done by design, but let's redesign it. That's the part I've figured out, which brings us all back together as a people group. We live in such a fake society, right? We live in our little neighborhood. We never know our neighbor, so we're all faking to each other. If we have designed a society to separate us all. We design 100-acre developments in days. If you live in America, you're driving along this road, and you look to the right, you see a, a neighborhood, and all the houses are in the same price range, 200 of them. Drive a little bit farther, there's another price range. Drive a little farther, and there's an apartment complex, and it has 250 units. We just separated ourselves based on income. That is mind-boggling. I'm gonna tell those 500 people how they're gonna live, and their kids are gonna live, and I can do it in 30 days. I've traveled all over the world, and the United States is the only place I've ever been in the, in, in the world that has such a isolated approach to how we live amongst our neighbors. I noticed when I moved to Dallas for the first time, because I'm from Kentucky, everybody had fences around their land and they were very, very protective. And that created a, a sense of isolation as opposed to creating a sense of community. People get in their car in the garage, they drive away, and you see them drive back in, they drive back in the garage, let the garage door down and go inside. You know, they don't take the time to just say hello to people. You know your colleagues, people who you're working with, but not the people who you live next to. And, uh, you know, the people who are making noise in the apartment upstairs or downstairs, you, you know them for the noise, but not for who they are. And now things are moving so much faster, and so the question is, how is it that we're going to come back together? No matter what you say, putting it, one million plus homes over here, the $250,000 homes here, and then the, the low-income housing here, I mean, you're never gonna have a united America. It's always gonna be divided, and it starts before you even pour the concrete. I want a movement to start across this country that is designing how we live to bring people together, not to continue to separate us. I used to be one of the largest real estate developers across the United States doing master plan communities. I came to Dallas in 81 and grew this company. We probably had over 100 employees. We were building condos and apartments. We were building retail. We were in the restaurant business. We were building resorts. We were developing three to 4,000 home sites a year. 
we had created over $2 billion worth of real estate assets across the country. Our company was on fire. One day out of the blue, the ambassador from Croatia came to Galveston, and within a few hours, I had agreed to go on a trip to Croatia, and we ended up buying a small interest in a large hotel on the island of Brach. I remember the first time I walked into Supertart and the other villages up and down the coast. It was so different than in the United States. Everything just made sense. If you go into a village and you see the little town square, you see the little shops, that you see above, people are living above the shops. They may be a travel agency above it. You could have a tall house, a big house next to a little house. As you get a little bit around, you see a church. All the streets lead to the middle of the village. You see all these little components, right? All the people live together. You can just, you can feel it, right? The concept of bringing everyone together as community, that's the way the Croatians live, even in the metropolitan areas. So one day I came into this little harbor here and uh, I was sitting on a bench and I noticed one of the bartenders walking through the harbor. So I asked him to sit next to me and we were just talking. I said, did you go to school here in this little village? And he said, yeah, I went to school here in this village. And then I went to law school in Zagreb and became a lawyer. I said, why don't you go to the big city and make more money? He goes, this is where my family is. Da je, da je isto tako, mi se ne volimo baš previše odvajati od našeg gnjezda. Volimo kad se djeca štimavaju, mi bi rekli na braću, po roditeljima, po nonotima i nona, nonama i u biti volimo tu nekakvu, taj nekakav kontinuitet života s obitelji. Svi smo nekako blizu i život uz obitelj daje, daje jednu sigurnost, daje jednu, jedan identitet koji svakako izgubite barem dijelom kad odete u veliki grad. I realize that in America, how we develop in the last 80 years is completely 100% wrong. I thought I was one of the top developers, but really I was the worst segregator. I was segregating society in income groups, saying if you made $30,000, you're gonna live in this neighborhood. If you make $100,000, you live in this neighborhood. If you make $200,000, you can live in this neighborhood. And people are making a million dollars, they would pack their bags and live far away because they all live together. He went to Croatia and had a real uh, epiphany about this. And I don't think he ever looked at um, real estate, planning, residences, anything in the same way again. Unless you're 80 or 90 years old or came from Europe or came from a little village somewhere in the United States, you don't see anything that's wrong because your frame of reference is your neighborhood just like mine. My frame of reference is I grew up in that neighborhood. That's right, that's how we, it's always been done, That's, but it's wrong. It's probably not the most fair thing, but at the same time, I guess, I mean, that's how it's always been. I'm wealthier than you, so I can live in this gated community. You have to live over here in this little, you know, trailer park, <laughs> whatever. Jeff had tremendous success as a builder of master planned communities. He built thousands and thousands of residential suburban homes and communities and developments. As I began to sit with him and understand the progression that he had made in learning how the process of segregation in America is really directly tied to the methodology of residential construction. We started putting people into buckets in their neighborhoods that were all alike. You made the same money as your neighbor, you bought the same type of house as your neighbor. So my apartments are here, my housing here, my mansions are here, my senior living is sitting over here. So we divided all this thing up. Should that senior living, should it be way over here by itself? No, that's the worst thing you could do for seniors. It's amazing that he's been able to go in and look and be like, that's what I did. I did that and I was successful at it. And then now he looks at it and he goes, that's not success. I successfully segregated different parts of North Dallas when I came down here as a developer. I was very successful 
in the real estate business. But I came back and I said, I'm not gonna do this anymore. And I started selling everything. Master plan communities in Dallas and in Frisco and all over the United States. I started selling everything because I was never gonna be a segregator again. For someone like him to suddenly have this realization that that is all kind of not the way we wanna do things anymore and to go completely in the other direction and to completely double down on what he's done is all the more striking. He's looked at where we've been as a country and where he's developed really for the last uh, two, or two decades or so of his life and said, I think there's a better way to do this. For two years, I traveled all the coastline of Croatia, down to Montenegro, over to Slovenia, over to Italy, all over Europe, taking 200,000 photos, trying to watch how the people walked and talked and tradition and families. He was studying really the people and how they interacted, and then also studying the, the concept of how the villages developed. I mean, the kids live right next to grandpa and grandma, live right next to the parents. Everybody lives here. That's why they love living here. That's why they don't want to go to America or go to London or wherever. They love living right here because they can all be a part of each other's lives every day. You know, it's funny. I, I think if you talk to people who live in conventional suburban subdivisions, they'll tell you that they have some of the best relationships. Uh, for example, people who live around a cul-de-sac, they know each other. Uh, but beyond that cul-de-sac, they really don't. And I think uh, to limit your relationships because you're confined to a particular part of a neighborhood, that suburban design uh, tends to limit your experience of developing new relationships. And that's the spice of life. I know my neighbors to a certain extent. We're not tight with them, but we're good neighbors with them. Nobody really goes out, so probably the only neighbors that I know, it's my high school buddy that lives across the street and, you know, my side neighbor. I knew the name of the people on either side of us, but uh, other than a couple of people in the neighborhood that I went to church with and, and a couple that I used to work with years ago, I, I didn't know anybody in the neighborhood. I know that I talked to, you know, some of the people that I work with you know, asking them, you know, well, do you guys ever get together with your neighbors or do you do this? And they're just like, I've been living in my house for four years and I think I've spoken to my neighbor three times. To me, that's sad. We have like a Facebook page <laughs> for the neighborhood where everybody can keep up with people. But we have not had a block party since I ran the Homeowners Association and it's been maybe eight years. All of this sort of feeds into uh, a separating of America and not having the kind of interaction that is healthy for a society. I think that the deception that we have in our culture today is that we are so divided. We're divided in every possible way you could be. We're divided racially, we're divided socioeconomically, we're divided politically, we're divided in every possible way you can. We're taught unconditionally in this country at a very young age to achieve at all costs. Achieve in school, go to college, get more degrees, make more money, get a bigger title, get a bigger house, get a bigger fence around that house, get a gate around that house. And so consequently, you have the upper, lower, middle class just completely spread out without any human connection. What I've learned on this journey is that when you lay those divisions aside and when you co-mingle with people and live with people that are unlike you, there's a richness and a depth that is immensely rewarding. It's hard to get along with each other if you're not seeing each other, if you're not interacting with each other. And that leads to that ability to, to uh, to create caricatures of people because you don't interact with them in any meaningful way. When the, the weather's nice and we can sit out on our porch and we can look at the park and, and there's just all different kinds of people down there playing basketball together, the kids are playing in the splash pool and, and there are no problems, there are no issues. There, and, and when you can look at the kids doing that, then it tends to make the adults kind of take a step back, I think, and see that, you know what, everybody can get along. And when you can see that happening every day and 
color and race doesn't have anything to do with it. Everybody's just interacting with one another. And I think that's something that is, is it gets lost sometimes. And it wasn't until, you know, till now to, that I've figured out how to do that, how to create that environment that we're all dependent on each other. Whether you make $100,000 or $20,000 or $5 million, we all need to live together. In a, in a village, the human value comes alive. It's not based on how much money you make. We're all equal. One of my favorite trips ever was to Iceland. And the reason that it was one of my favorite trips is because they're known for their geothermal pools. The entire community, whether it's the billionaire, the teacher, the business person, the lawyer, the whomever, all literally meet in these central pools, which is what so much of that country is about. And being there three times now, it was just so evident that there's so much, there's so many interesting things, and there's so much, so much texture that we lose as a result of all of the separation. When I was coming back from Supertar on the plane, I wanted to figure out a way to recreate the environment where it was truly a community and everybody was dependent on each other. The old people were happy, the young people were happy and content. They were all one big family. Could that actually be done in America? And then I said, man, I want to build a village. Everybody in real estate said I was nuts. Yeah, I, I drove through a village and I said, I want to recreate a village in America. Who's going to believe that? People left my company. They thought I was crazy. I was like, man, Jeff, you, you, cut lots. You know, you know, do lot development. Keep that going. Have some money on the side, and then kind of work this little village dream on the side. And that, Jeff couldn't do that. I found out some things about Jeff that I think has had an enormous impact on what drives him to do what he does today. You know, he certainly wasn't, you know, the rich kid from Harvard that had, you know, a billion dollar trust fund waiting on him when he turned 21 to just, you know, blow on lavish lifestyle. You know, he was a guy who came from, you know, hardworking, middle class family, like most Americans. I grew up in Peoria, Illinois a small town in central Illinois, and uh, just grew up as a normal kid, played basketball and ran track. I signed a national letter of intent to go to school at Northwestern. After graduating from Northwestern, I went to work with my dad because my father was in the home building business and my grandfather was in the home building business. I landed a job in land development. 1983, the market started turning and I was right in the middle of it. But I always knew something fundamentally was wrong on, on what we were doing. And I was always trying to mix more uses. or always trying to, to um, create an environment that the homeowners would really want. Most of conventional suburbia is designed in the opposite way with cookie cutter cul-de-sacs, the way that nobody really wants to live anymore. As a society, we're on our journey back to being a village. But if people don't know what a village is, we're stuck. Village sort of conveys activity, life, motion, community, people interacting. It has all the necessities you need in life. You have homes, you have shops, you have personal services, you have places of worship, uh, you have other institutions, schools. People, I think, yearn for that, that connection of being in a town where they know who the shop owners are, shop owners know who they are, uh, the homes are uh, close to their neighbors, they're close to the street. You can sit on the front porch and see your friends and neighbors walking past. Just being able to walk around and and seeing just all kinds of people, you know, you know they're from all different walks of life. People just nod and speak and, you know, you don't even know them. And, and it makes it, it makes you feel more connected. We're talking about a place that creates safety, community, uh, sustainability, uh, protection. 
the benefits of Village Living are uh, my kids can walk downstairs and go get something to eat without me having to drive them. Uh, I can pop out at five minutes till to go to get my hair cut for my haircut appointment. I mean, when you can walk to have your basic daily needs met, your life is completely transformed. And I don't think people really realize that until they are in that life, but there's all kinds of health statistics on why it's better for you emotionally, it's better for your weight, it's better for, for everything, for you not have to be in your car so much. It's just fun. Walk down the street, get a cup of coffee, say hi to your neighbor. You come down to the cafe and there's, there's three little cafes, there's an ice cream shop and two restaurants and, and you know everyone, you know, the cafe is not called the name of the cafe, it's called Mario's Place because it's, it's Mario who runs it and Mario looks after you and you know him. Oh, it's so nice. I would come home in New Zealand and my neighbours would be sitting at my table eating food and not one family member would be there. And what would have happened is my mum had them over for a, afternoon tea or something and then she had to go out so she said oh you guys just hang out here and they just stay there and it's very different. People working together helping each other out all in the same area um, and it's something that's communal and something that's more intimate. In the olden days, you know, before the post-war suburban boom, villages were created and towns were created around the needs of humans. And originally that, um, that started out of railroads. So the main way of transportation was railroads. You got off the railroad in your town, you needed to buy things on the way home. And so all these little shops sprouted up around the railroad station. Somebody came along and said, this town needs a uh, dry goods store. So he opens up a store and then another one, then, then you get some people moving in. And the next thing you know, they need a hospital and, and going to have, a, have to have a sheriff or a policeman or something. We went from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy, and cities start to develop very rapidly. Suburbs were, were in place. We had these developments on the far edges of cities, but they weren't as large or as popular as they are today. When they brought the car in, it started separating us. Everything was designed for the car, not humans. Roads, the roads bring uh, allow to the ex to expansion of the city and at the same time they decimate the soul and the village concept that they had in the, orig in the origin. The development of putting in highways uh, to serve the military and then under Eisenhower uh, single-family homes created spatial dispersion in a way that we hadn't seen since prior to the Industrial Revolution. Spatial economics or spatiality is a very fancy word for a very simple but basic concept. And it really comes down to the cost of distance. So if you think about the cost of distance, it's something that is so natural, so much a part of our everyday lives that we really don't even think about it. If you drive an hour to work every day in an hour home, that's two hours in your car, that's a lot of time in your car. Well, you go to work at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock and you get home at 6.30 or 7. I mean, where's the time go? We're kind of out in the country. It's about 30 or 35 miles. Um, it might be 45 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on traffic, just to get there in the morning. So we've given up our social component to our life to have this residential component out in the suburbs. And, and I'm a victim of that too. I go to work and I, as soon as five o'clock hits, I'm straight home and as quickly as I can get in this door, shut that garage door before any neighbors see me or want to strike up an awkward conversation because I've lived here for two years without talking to them, right? So the longer as it goes, I mean, a year from now, I'm going to be worse off than I am right now because it's going to be even more awkward conversation, right? They're like, yeah, you're the guy that moved in three years ago and still hasn't spoken to us. But that's the norm and it's not expected. We've made eye contact plenty of times. We've introduced ourselves once. Uh, we'll wave and say hello to one another every now and again, but we've never been to their house. They've never been to our house. It simplified certain things, but sometimes that's not sustainable. So I think quality of life was perceived to be great for a while. And now the notion that you have to have mom drive you everywhere until you have a license or if you're an older person and you can't drive anymore, you have to be relegated to a, uh, a retirement home, I think are, are the downsides of purely suburban living. As a developer, I decide how you live. I control that you have no place to go because there's nowhere to walk to, right? You're on the street, you got a goofy little sidewalk and 
You got your two oak trees in front. I mean, I'm making people unhealthy, if you think about it. First, we started doing subdivisions, and then we started doing master plan communities, and then all the new buzzwords, new urbanism, but we don't know where we're going. Well, new urbanism is a new approach to development that really has been unrolling slowly across the country for the past 25 years, where you wanted to create an environment that was walkable, that was compact, that had a diverse variety of land uses in it. The new urbanists felt that uh, this was a response to creating real places, going back to the way we used to build cities. Our country was sprawling, and so new urbanism is a way of building compact, walkable communities at a really pedestrian scale that people can relate to, where all services are within walking distance. So on a positive side, new urbanism actually offered a lot of value and a new way of thinking. But they also started questioning the way we zone here in the U.S. And so there was a whole movement of coming up with different type of ways that we code uh, for our cities. They started challenging, why are we building these large roads just for fire trucks, let's rethink it. And so it was really a movement to think, rethink in the 21st century, how we build and design our communities. When you think about new urbanism, it's retail on the first floor and multifamily on the second. Or it's retail on the first floor and office on the second. That's all it is. It's, it's, it's taking a step past master plan communities and how retail was and trying to combine them both together. That's fine, but it doesn't solve any of our problems. It doesn't have a diverse income base. You don't have a $10 million house in the middle of new urbanism, right? And you don't have a cheap apartment in there either. Or a small house. You don't have, any, you don't have, have all the components. You just got a couple of components. I mean, they're, they're cute when you look at them, but they're missing that original charm that a true village has. You know, I remember going with Jeff to Supertar Split in Croatia, and we'd met a mayor of the, of the city. And we went through his house. It's this real cool house. I mean, you go in this, this little courtyard, and there's all these different, really, buildings. And it wasn't a mansion type, say, but it was, you know, it was just very interesting the way the house was. You go into a courtyard, and then there's a door over here and a door here in different areas. And it was very, some of it was brand new, some of it was very old. It was very, Interesting, and, and Jeff goes, well, what, what's this right over here? And he goes, well, that's where this uh, basically homeless guy lives. And Jeff was really intrigued by that. And he goes, well, you know, you're the mayor. And he says, well, yeah, but this guy's part of our community. And Jeff, I guarantee you, that Jeff saw that. And he said, that's how we're gonna change the world. Yeah, this is a very special place right here, this courtyard. This is kind of where it all began because I never really realized how a real community really works. And like this place right here, this villa, a millionaire lives right here. The restaurant owner lives right there. The bus boy lives right here. The kitchen is right there. It's just interesting, we all, we all should live together. We always talk about that in America, live, work, play, all this garbage that I hear forever. But this is like the perfect environment, and that's how villages have been done from thousands and thousands of years. We all live together, and this is just a perfect example of how we're supposed to live together. If you have everything, everybody on the same sort of line of, 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 of wealth and, and education and, and, and all that, you end up with a very boring place. I mean, it's a place that you don't want to go there and visit. You know, do you think a Parisian would take a plane and go to suburbia America to go discover suburbia America? Probably not. When you put people in proximity of different incomes uh, and in their, in their homes, then you really force interaction because people have to work together in their community association or their neighborhood. Uh, and so you, you bring people together in a way that you wouldn't uh, by creating artificial gathering uh, places. I love Jeff. Uh, the irony is, is that I'm a pretty uh, liberal uh, person. Uh, Jeff would uh, uh, probably uh, uh, describe himself as very conservative, uh, which means we're both small c conservative. Or maybe a better word, dare he allow me to say this, is that we're both progressive. And the reason I say that is 
On social issues, we may not agree, uh, but on the fundamental issues of what it takes for this country to sustain itself long-term, which is great neighborhoods, uh, I think that's the common denominator. We, we never create environments. That's what a village is. We never create a an environment that naturally comes together where people come together as an intersection. We may have differences, racial, economic, could be Democrat, Republican, but we depend on each other. Možda je najljepši osjećaj s kojim ovaj, se mi tu na otoku rađamo i s kojim živimo cijeli svoj život i kojeg nosimo u sebi je upravo taj osjećaj pripadnosti. Pripadnosti svome mistu, svojemu kvartu na neki način. Svi mi rođeni u Supetru smo prvenstveno Supetrani i braćani. Bez obzira na imovinski status, bez obzira na razinu školovanja koje imamo, prijatelju i u doktor, čistač ulice, činovnik, svi smo mi, svi smo mi tu i u biti. It's, it's the village life that is extraordinary because uh, once you become part of a village, it's not like being in the city where you're one of an anonymous uh, set of people. You know people, you know everyone, and they know you. But that, that closeness in relationships of knowing everyone, all the different people, it's so lovely. It's so lovely. Wenn ich, wenn ich das erste Mal hier nach Subita gekommen bin, vor 40 Jahren, es ist einfach wunderschön gewesen. Die Leute haben mich mit offenen Armen empfangen und waren, waren wirklich in jeder Richtung hilfsbereit. Und immer wieder war die Freundlichkeit und die Zuverlässigkeit und die Hilfsbereitschaft der, der Bewohner von Subita für mich eine Garantie, hier bin ich richtig. For me as a parent, the most important difference in living in a large city is a huge sense of security. Everybody knows each other and looks after each other's kids. You know, you live together, you know each other's secrets to an extent, of course, but you also watch over each other. Uh, and that's, the, that's a pleasure, it's a beauty of living in a in village. So when I think about what Jeff Blackard's doing and I look and I see that, that the goal is for the community to get back together working in the village mindset, where everybody leans on each other. Uh, my grandmother, Leslie Cannon, was, you know, the rock behind our family. And we talk about a village. I remember I, probably 10 years in the big leagues already. And I went home one time to see her and I was sitting in her kitchen. And she, and I was, I was facing the door and she was facing me. Her back was to the door. And this little white kid comes in the back door, opens the refrigerator, grabs something, walks out the back door, and takes off. I'm looking on like, Grandma, who was that? And she's with a family across the alley. Their lights are cut off. And they're using our electricity, uh, and they're keeping stuff in our refrigerator. And she was like, don't say a word. Everybody needs help from time to time. As African Americans, we understand village from a different premise, and many of us been, have been reminded that you know we come from origins that are very village centric. It's not just your immediate family that's participating in your rearing or well-being or your safety or your protection or your knowledge or uh, and hopefully the transfer of wisdom, but it's the uncle, the aunt, the neighbor, the friend, uh, the pastor. Transfer of wisdom in its purest form is somebody older has more experience, shares his experience of life with somebody younger, somebody younger shares their experiences with somebody older. When people are older, there's so much great wisdom that they can really uh, give you because they know about life. They teach us how to laugh, they teach us how to cry, but they also teach us how to just let go. And so it really is a moment where you can really capture so much greatness really from seniors because again, they have lived. I en enjoy spending some time with, with younger people, interacting and, and I can, uh, I feel like I relate to them pretty good. All you can do is spend, is spend time with them and, and try to tell them, you know, what, what things were like then. And I think, you know, definitely the, the younger generations should respect the older generation, but then, then again, the older generations gotta respect the younger generations. And that, that might be a bigger failing is, is the other way. They, they glean from each other, they give and they take from each other, and there's a structure to that that would build a lot of strong personalities that are currently missing. Because there are people that said when I was growing up, based on where I come from, I wasn't going to amount to anything. And had I remained in that environment, 
without older men, white men in the Navy, and black pastors around the country that believed in me, I might be in jail, or maybe in prison, or certainly something, something else, possibly dead. But because I was able to leave that environment and go into on ships, which is a type of village, and rub shoulders with, with millionaire sons who are serving, and some of the brightest people in the country, to work with them every day and see the people, they're men just like me, except they work hard. And being in that village concept, it gives hope. And without hope, what do people have? If you just put a bunch of people all together that have the exact same shortcomings and they don't know how to reach out for help, they're only gonna talk about the struggles that they face. So we lived, at, uh, we lived in a trailer, three bedroom trailer. Uh, we were there for right around five years. And I've met plenty of folks who just feel like they're stuck and don't know what to do to get out of a situation. And I was working at a college. I was just, you know, a cook. And I was getting laid off every summer, which I did not enjoy. So I took what I thought was gonna be a summer job, just cooking for disadvantaged kids for the summer. And by the end of that summer, they offered me a full-time position because the chef saw something in me. Everybody needs a hand up sometimes. So you live in an apartment and this person lives in a multi-million dollar house. Okay, what you're really trying to get is a relationship between these two people, right? That they talk, they share wisdom, they do all this. Or I come over to your house, you come over to my house. You're rich, I'm poor, it's okay. Because we create this relationship here where it's pure. Just being able to bring people from all different walks of life together. Because to me, in my mind, the individual that makes $11,000 to the individual that makes a million dollars a year, somebody has something to contribute. There's something that that person knows that you don't. And I think that if you, if you allow that to come in and put it in a position where all these people can be together and talk, then you're gonna learn something from somebody. Sometimes we need to take a step back and, and look at some of, the, some of the simpler things. Why can't we go back to having a community, a village that's small, compact, diverse, accessible, green, sustainable, and an attractive place to live? And it has to be careful about how do you design it and how you provide for changes, because you cannot recreate something that took 200, 300, 400 years and, and develop. This is an old stone house built by my great-great-grandfather. This is, you know, how people in, in the village live. It's a part of a life. It's, it's a part of the story. These two graves are my family graves here at the village cemetery. My ancestors are buried here, five generations, dating back in the second half of the 19th century. A village has the evolution process knitted into it. So the best you can do is emulate the evolution. And that's the part I figured out. It's designing based on the evolution process that did create a village. And I figured that piece out, which brings us all back together as a people group. Everything started with two people coming together, right? And then there's three and then six and then 20 in a village, right? And as the village evolved over time, people would specialize in different things. So it would evolve. And everything in that village, when they had two people, 10 people, 20 people, they, they would all have a purpose and they would have a responsibility. And everything would be designed for a purpose. Obviously, we don't do that today, right? We take a piece of property and a bulldozer and just cut up and put retail in the corners and pods of housing here and there, right? But if you, if you think through how a village would have evolved and you put those components in there to grow it to whatever population you want it to be, then the village will be successful. Is if you design it based on the, how something would have evolved naturally over time, grew, then everything comes together. Just like the different angles of this 
these different buildings, probably based on the topography. Probably the stone, you can see the stone foundation right here. Everything they do have a purpose. When you actually sit there and draw, you gotta tell a story of the village. You're laying out each one of the buildings because then every building has a purpose. We got a design that everything comes together for humans to communicate and they only build what's needed by this community. It is going back to that organic bottom up, serving the needs of actually the humans and the residents who live there. You know, the towns and the old European towns, and I mean, you're talking 600, 800 years of history in which they evolved to, to balance the whole thing. We have to go back to Europe to, to, to look at the model that works, to look at a model uh, that's um, sustainable, because when you have a much smaller footprint for a city, you can basically achieve so much more and use much less resources, natural resources. You can use your land around it for agriculture, for other things than just buildings and parking lots and highways, which in the end don't bring any quality of life to, to our cities. I really think that what he's bringing back is a return to this more organic and evolutionary, not revolutionary, but evolutionary idea of growth. Go to the, some of the older parts of an, of an older city and you will see homes that date back to the 1890s, some, sometimes earlier than that. I find it difficult looking at the quality of construction that's going up in many parts of the country today to see these homes lasting a hundred years. When they built this neighborhood, they used the cheapest materials they could find, I believe. We've had two homes burned down. That's how bad the quality is. Those homes went up. They went up like that. I do think Jeff's idea of the village really embraces this idea of multi-generational, century-type housing that really uh, forms the, the content and the fabric of these communities. Jeff is going back and forth between, you know, Dallas and, 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 uh, and, and Supertar Split and, and Croatia. And Jeff was studying the village concept. I had spent years researching villages all over the world, and now I was ready to go try to build a village. I met Jeff through one of his associates, someone that worked for him. We were meeting with an, a, a lunch meeting with a, an accountant, and I shared some of my work, and he thought it looked pretty interesting. So I went to meet Jeff at his office and uh, met a very charismatic and uh, uh, creative individual. And uh, within a few days, uh, we were uh, on a trip to Croatia. The, that afternoon, we met a few folks and immediately went to work. Uh, we didn't spend much time eating, drinking, or anything. You know, it was just go to work and we're going to gather as much information as we can. And Jeff wanted me to absorb the detail of the architecture and how the, 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 the lay of the city. This building was originally was originally stone, right? And then it started having some issues, so then they came in and they used this to shore up the outside, to shore up the whole building, right? This used to be one story. This was some guy's house on the harbor, probably a fisherman. And then you can see that his family, they, they built the next story and then the next story. So you can just see the history all within this right here. That person built his own bottom, but you can tell somebody else built that piece, and now you can see somebody else built that piece. So you get three different personalities right there. And you can just see that even, even the road here, you can see this is a long time ago, the stone, then, then the history of concrete, right? And really you can see stone, then you can see brick. Stone was first, then brick and then modern day concrete, all right there you can see. Just see how they used to do um, porches? It's just so fascinating how they put the concrete back in there. And I'm sure this piece of concrete right here is this long back this way to hold this weight up here. All of a sudden I was totally stimulated by the architecture, by Jeff's vision, 
what he was trying to accomplish, and I was trying to draw all these little elements and I, a vision of a, of a village. And then I started looking at more of the detail in terms of how they were built. Uh, it's, it's a much bigger than challenge because it doesn't fit in the normal box. There are some other efforts across the country to bring back village life. I mean, I think there, the good news is there's a greater acceptance that this has gone missing and we need to bring it back in some way. Uh, but no, no one has done them in a way that Jeff has done them that is just so meticulous and so authentic. Jeff really gets that. He really, really gets what it takes. I think he went to a place beyond just being a developer of physical real estate to being a developer of um, a philosophy, if you would. I had to name what we were doing. We're not new urbanists, okay? And we're not a village, but, we, but we're in the middle. We call that idea neo-retroism. Neo for new, retro for old, ism for a philosophy. There is a yearning to return to some of the development patterns that we have grown up with as a civilization. Uh, if you go back hundreds of years, thousands of years, humankind has always grouped together in small villages. I think that's the essence of his uh, philosophy behind village life, is everything has a purpose, everything serves, everyone, everything's there for a reason, and it grows as it's needed rather than dumping a whole lot of things in and then them failing and disappearing. It just grows organically. People, people yearn for that type of thing. They might not be able to communicate it, but they feel it and they know it when they see it. I've been working on this for 12 years. Nobody understands what I'm doing. It's hard to explain. All the universities across the country, around the world, don't teach this, right? They teach, they teach zoning and architecture and new urbanism and stuff like this, so there's no platform. And so I decided to have a conference with the leading people in the world to tell the world that what I'm doing, neo-retroism, is right. By as early as 2025, there may be more exurbanites than urbanites, and perhaps in not too many years, it will no longer be accurate to talk about the U.S. as an urbanized nation, perhaps more like uh, one of the first major exurbanized nations. And when Jeff was talking about the village, the microeconomy serving its own, who better able to understand what it is that people crave than the people who also live that same life. When we had the opportunity, my colleague Austin Kimson and I, to attend the conference on neo-retroism, it, it was a really moving day because it was many people from different walks of life ultimately trying to solve the problem of improving the quality of life of people the way they they live and the kind of preferences that we anticipate, we can't see into the future, but the kind of preferences that we anticipate are uh, matching the kinds of instincts that neo retroism that Jeff's developments have. And that's what I find so interesting about them. I, I actually think the neo retroism concept is, is, is a perfect solution for rural America today to reinvigorate it. I mean, there's no doubt that America is separating itself into urban and suburban marketplaces. You know, and you're always gonna have your extreme wealthy and extreme poverty, but you have kind of more of a, a, a vast kind of middle class that has high middle class, low middle class, really live in the same neighborhoods. For the very affluent, cities have become better and better places to live. And you see investments in places like New York, uh, where we are now, on the High Line, London, the bike lanes, parks, and amenities that make them more attractive. But every one of those amenities reduces a place for affordable housing, if such a thing can exist. And so that middle class had been pushed out to the margins. Because of the way urban areas have developed, uh, there is that separation, that balkanization, and uh, the village concept within urban uh, centers, which of course America is increasingly urbanized and increasingly urban and suburbanized metropolitan areas. Unless you intentionally create something that brings people together, uh, people are not gonna come together. And my real goal for that whole conference was to go to Wall Street and say, hey, you got a category for housing, you have a category for retail, industrial parks, new urbanism, 
please give me a category for villages or neo-retroism. Carve me out that piece. One of the charges with neo-retroism for us is to make it sustainable. So people are in fact safe there, both physically and financially safe there. So as we begin to build the financial model, as we lay the village out, we have to think about what are the right uses and the right economics for each use. The villages need to be micro-economies in the sense that people need to be able to stay and work there. So what are the industries, the, clearly retail is one that can be there. So one of my uh, favorite things to talk about is, as you look at the explosion of things like microbreweries and distilleries and micro bakeries and, and all sorts of artisanal crafts, I'm not a connoisseur, but one could say really what defines them is that they're local, right? That it may not be the world's best brewery or bakery or butcher shop, but it's mine. It's my neighborhoods. I think people come here because of the atmosphere. The beer is awesome. One of the biggest things that we have been able to accomplish here is the local community, is getting all the local businesses together and sharing the same love for what we do. And now we do events together all the time and they're all our friends now, you know. We, we hang out, we drink a lot together and we, you know, have a lot of community. Through the evolution of, of spatial economics in two places like the New Village, um, it creates more individual spaces. So you have the the feel of the small town of America, but the amenities that, that come with a, an urban center around you. It's an opportunity for a, a variety of, of entertainment and dining and, and community activities because you brought people together in sort of a contained area that you wouldn't find in, uh, in sort of a rural small town. So it's, it's sort of the best of both. And I can tell you from having gone back and forth to Europe over the last 10 years in places like Angiari, and to see the development of those villages as the internet and 21st century living is coming to be, um, th there are businesses that are flourishing there. And I think America needs more of that. The ability to create better quality of life live, work, and play because the cost of distance has gone down, because people are no longer, are increasingly less beholden to being clustered for work. They're able to, to live in smaller centers where, again, their more affordable quality of life is better. Jeff Blacker's the real deal. Um, he does what he says he's gonna do. He came in with this idea of creating a European village in the United States. And he had a piece of land that he had selected. He had kind of laid out how he wanted to, and he was struggling with the name for this. And we went through a lot of different uh, brainstorming sessions, and eventually the idea of Adriatica popped up between our conversations. I'm like, that's it, that's perfect. When the concept of Adriatica came along and the land became available in McKinney, you know, I was, I was there helping him and as a, as a friend more than anything, and then eventually became, you know, his, his banker. So I looked everywhere for a piece of real estate to build this village. And I came to McKinney and found this great piece of real estate but I had to go to the landowners and say, I want to build a village there. I think they thought I was crazy, but since I had been a successful developer for a long period of time, they bought into my dream of building a village. And then I started on my journey of zoning this piece of property. With a city who has built in ordinances and zoning codes and setbacks and height requirements and material requirements, this is not something that is easy to just start building. I think there's there's a handful of obstacles that, oddly enough, we've created ourselves. The first is the collection of zoning ordinances around the country, which were developed in the early part of the last century. Prior to zoning, uh, most of the time, people would just sue one another to stop things from happening next to their property or put restrictive declarations on property to avoid blacks and Jews or multifamily from being developed on their property. There came a point in time when cities were growing so fast, uh, people were dying, the way places were being built, lack of sanitation, poor housing, they felt we had to put a tool in place. So there was a law passed that would start to regulate the density, the height, the type of uses, parking and other elements to control how development would occur. And then as it evolved over time and went across the country, where cities had city councils and planning commission, but city councils, where, where the city could control what could be built on what's next to you. And they 
forcibly push land uses apart from each other. And so I think what happened was is that the politics of self-selection, some of it included uh, historically and still today some racism, uh, some of it included just stratification in terms of people wanting to be with uh, similar economic, uh, folks in the similar economic status. Starting with FHA, Federal Housing Administration, on how they were giving out mortgages and discriminated against a lot of populations, redlining practices, urban renewal, uh, single-family homes and how certain people couldn't afford it. I mean, we have cities in America that don't allow any multifamily. Somebody that teaches the kids in the school can't live in the same city as the kids they're teaching. Some cities around the country are starting to realize this and are open to changing those, those um, regulatory policies. However, it's a long, hard battle. It's not without its challenges. And in some cases, cities find it's easier just not to do anything because it's something that would become a political football with their, their residents. I think that uh, we've been doing the same mistakes for the last 50, 60 years, and we're used to them, and it became bad habits. Everybody was opposed. All the neighbors was, were opposed. It was but I just kept on coming. And so I just bought the property. So I spent another year and probably a million dollars trying to explain what a village is. Eventually, some of the homeowners got it. The city council was totally against it. I remember back when he was having to go to, go to city council and um, you know the zoning laws and trying to fight and explain to everybody what his dream was all about, what this concept was all about. It was challenging at first. There was a lot of skepticism as to whether or not something like that could be really pulled off. We didn't really have ordinances in place that really dealt with a lot of the uh, things that he wanted to build. A certain percentage of commercial had to be built. A certain number of single family residential units had to be built. And so there, there were a lot of limitations in place. I love to remind people, where do you travel and spend a lot of money? Typically it's to a place where you can walk, you know, sit at a cafe and watching people walk by. And you pay a ton of money to get there, you pay a ton of money to stay in the hotel there, and you pay a ton of money to eat there. And so we actually get on a plane and fly somewhere for a vacation for the things that we actually yearn for in our own neighborhood, but we're not willing to vote on that same neighborhood in our own community. What's that about? They did not get it, okay? to open zoning and uh, you know you you have a, a million dollar house right next to a flat then you've got you know retail here and then you got a church here and it's all mixed and in, in everything boy they just didn't get it and Jeff did a phenomenal job him and his team did a great job putting it together to try to help the city understand it I get to watch Jeff go through the process of trying to communicate that vision to city leaders uh, and the notion of a village, I think, at first was viewed as antithetical to the quality of life of McKinney. I was fighting everybody. I was fighting myself. Am I really right? Am, am I, can I really take, take the soul of this village and put it on the water? Will people really go there? Not too many developers would have the nerve to attempt to do something like this because it it's just hasn't been done. Eventually, after two years, the homeowners came to City Hall and told them, if you don't approve the zoning, we'll make sure you're not elected again. They filled the whole chamber. It was amazing. Um, so we got the zoning, and then we started. It was kind of interesting. So now I have the zoning. I have the ability to go build this huge village. And it's like, wow, I actually, it's the beginning point of a journey that, that no one's been down. So we did spend a lot of time in Italy and Croatia and um, all over the world really looking for materials and getting authentic materials to use in the buildings. The stone, the arches, the artwork, the masonry, the, the, the attention to detail had tremendous complexity and richness. Uh, and they went way above and beyond. It's constructed in a way that it'll be here for a much longer time than the typical uh, subdivision where people are only worrying about it for 10 or 15 years. 
uh, they were thinking in terms of, of generations, not just a uh, uh, five or 10 year period. We're just really selective with artisans and craftsmen and every building to Jeff is special and he's passionate about every detail. And I think little by little, as he started building one building at a time, people started to then see that this was gonna be something amazing. Everything is unique. You know, every home is for that individual. It's no, there's no home, single home, that's exactly the same as another. I'm really excited to see he's on something. This, this land that he's got and everything that he's trying to do makes perfect sense. So um, it, it still looked, took a little bit. Uh, the recession never helped. 2008, nine and 10, and 10 took place and it was, it was difficult. We have a real estate based economy. And when we're in the crapper, in the recession, a lot of times it's because the elements of the real estate community aren't functioning properly. You can't get financing, the builders aren't building, the homes aren't selling, all of the things. The realtors aren't making brokerage fees as the houses are sold, and it ripples through the entire economy. Uh, we were right on the, gosh, it, it hit us right in the, the middle of that. You know, we were moving forward and, and then everything everything comes to a screeching halt. You know, my bank couldn't finance any more money. I had a parking garage sticking outside of the ground, 750 parking spaces. You know, servicing at one time $22 million of debt each month. I almost went broke, literally. I mean, honestly, you know, it was one, of the, it was the toughest time I remember looking out of the bell tower, which I was officing with him at the time, and I was on the seventh floor, and uh, I, I want to say one of the contractors were looking for him, and I was like, well, I know he's around, and then I remember looking out the window, and he was just laying there with a bowl of water next to him, and I was like, hmm, why not the best look if an investor came by and wanted to invest in development to see the, the developer laying on the ground, and, of the soccer field stressed out so much about the development. I mean, it affected everything, you know. Affected my kids because I was so passionate about finishing the village. Um, affected my marriage. I'm actually surprised she hung in there. It was a passion, something inside that was like a dream that he had that he wanted to see become a reality. And again, those kind of dreams are, are costly sometimes. It seems like everything who I, I had become for my, all, my whole career was, you know, I built this whole career, but really it was the village was the, was what I needed to finish. His passion was still there. Going through the drudges of the crash, he's still dreaming and still believing and still getting his way through it. Part of any journey, but a journey where you're trying to persevere is not quitting. He made some pretty bad personal economic decisions of continuing to put his own money into the Adriatica deal to try to, to, to keep it alive. I wasn't ever going to give up. I was using everything I owned to make sure the village came about. He had a very clear vision for what Adriatica could be, and he wasn't going to make any modifications. He knew that the only way it would work is if he would be able to fulfill uh, his mission. Jeff Blackard is the most tenacious man I have ever known. He is focused when he is on a project, he's all in. Um, I mean, our life kind of swirls around his love for building villages, and I've, I've learned to love it and love him in a way that I guess helps me to understand how important it is to go back and, and really correct things that we've done in America. Jeff is proof that, you know, persistence can pay off and will pay off. And if he had not been persistent, Adriatica would not exist. I will never forget when we, you know, we're driving through McKinney, Texas, there's this sort of strip mall, and then you like hang a right and down a hill, there is this sort of sea of cobblestone. <laughs> it just looks like all of a sudden you're like in a fishing village, 2000 years old. <laughs> it just was really fascinating. 
It was amazing to just watch his dream become a, a reality. I think if I were to use one word, I would say it's enduring because they weren't just worried about the vote at the Planning Commission, ultimately the McKinney City Council. They were worried about whether or not Adriatica is going to be here 100 years from now. And why would they worry about Adriatica being here 100 years from now? Well, that's the whole essence of a village, is that it's multi-generational, multi that it will reinvent itself, that you will put it there and it will take care of itself over time. I had seen a lot of communities and a lot of transit-oriented development, urban walkable villages in the suburbs. I had seen a lot of these kinds of communities and I had never seen anything like Adriatica. I knew the moment my feet hit the ground here, I, mean, I was in awe of what the city looked like. I think that once we started building the village and they started seeing the homes and the people living in the village, that they were happy. Then we would have a restaurant open up and all the pe the villagers will come to the restaurant. And guess what? The concept of a village is getting out of your home and being outside with your neighbors, right? That is the healthiest thing you do. And then you open up a restaurant and everybody that gathers in the restaurant are your fellow villagers. I lived in New York City for two years and I can tell you my neighbors' names in those neighborhoods, but I, I didn't interact with them like I interact with people here. You get to know people on a, on a level much, much different. We could, you know, get a workout in in the morning at the gym downstairs, go to breakfast afterwards, run into friends, maybe go to a concert and never get in our car. As it populates with people, people are congregating in areas and creating relationships. So when my children came here, my wife and I, we let them stay out till like 10, 11 o'clock at night one night. They were just walking around hanging out with some friends. And I would have never did that in Flint, <laughs> never. It's such a great experience to, um, to have neighbors, to have fellowship, people from all different walks of life, to have shopkeepers. I love Gregory's. I mean, who doesn't love Gregory's? We bring get different gifts and talents to the neighborhood and, and we're all working together here to make life wonderful. I like the sense of community and I like the sense of, like I said, everybody has stake in it. So this is our community. It's more than just a place uh, where people can come and live and play and have recreation. And that's, it's, a, it's, it's something that I really think that is going to change the mentality of how we think of one another. There's this overwhelming sense of just joy and, and, and peace. And, and I, don't, I don't think I've ever had that in a residential setting before until I got to Adriatica. This right here is one of those places that, you know, I could live here. You know, this could remind me of the way I grew up in a village where everybody was going in the right direction, in a positive direction, helping people, you know, get further in life. There's just this sense, and again, it's, I believe, a sense of history, of belonging, of roots, of saying, wow, I can build my life forward from this. I learned that people from all walks of life can coexist in the same area and not be strange. Proximity, face to face with people, builds relationships. It feels like family to a degree. I wouldn't have these relationships if, if the Lord hadn't brought me to Adriatica. And, um, and, it, and I don't have isolation anymore. In a neighborhood like this, you're not in a bubble. You can't be in a bubble if you want to be in a bubble. If you don't love people, then you can't live in this lifestyle. I think that when you expose people to more things, different cultures, different you know, diversity, then it opens them up to be a little bit more accepting of, of people that are different or situations that are different. A lot of people from a lot of different walks of life and, and young and old, and it's a great thing. I take my iPhone to the young ones all the time and go, something's not working and I can't stand reading instructions. And, you know, someone will come to me and ask me for prayer or, you know, I know you've gone through this situation before, how do I handle it? And um, th that's the way we all should be operating with each other. I think that if everyone had a chance to live and to see and to feel what a village brings, I think that's the answer to those world's problems. It's amazing that um... It's worked as well as it's worked. I mean, there's a lot of people that 
I know that live in the uh, single family homes, moving into the apartments, restaurants that are doing really well, retail along the front edge on Virginia is always busy. So, you know, I'd like to see more restaurants and some things develop, but again, you know, these things don't happen overnight. and. And the plan is there. Well, Adriatica is the tip of the iceberg because it's just a little hint of what you could do. It's just a little sample, it's a teaser of what you could do. This village thing, he was onto something so much bigger. And uh, I think him going through all the trials with the North Dallas uh, village, Adriatica village, opened his eyes to it being this is much bigger than us just focusing on one village, but it needs to be rolled out in multiple communities and it's gonna really be a solution to a lot of the problems that we create by the way we develop. People always ask me, does the village work here or here or here? You know the most interesting thing? It is the solution everywhere. We've just started working on a project in Detroit, in the worst of the worst. So we're working on a village to prove that that is the solution just like it is the solution in North Dallas it's a solution everywhere. And once it's done four or five or six times, then all of America will start doing it. I think people are fed up. I think people are, are hungry for what's next if that works in their life, or they're willing to take the chance and to see if there's something better beyond what we've all been taught. Usually there is. We need to get out of the way and allow developers like Jeff to deliver a variety in the marketplace, and I think we'll be pleasantly surprised that there will be people lining up for these neighborhoods. There's something like 50 cities of, a hundred, of, of one or two million people in construction as we speak in China. What if they could have time to sit with someone like Jeff and look, how can we lay down this town from scratch? He knows that it works and it can transform inner cities, it can, you know, he goes to India and the, the leaders of India are saying, come back and build us thousands of villages because they got a problem. If we believe in status quo, we don't need Jeff. If we want to change the status quo, we need people like Jeff who can actually push these ideas and, and, and he's his own warrior. He's a warrior and he's going to go and do it. And I wish him a lot of success. I, I do believe that Jeff's vision for um, putting us back together in a village setting, in a community that really depends on one another, that is almost self-sustaining to some degree, is correct. I believe his motivation is people, it is helping, it's giving. I don't think Blackard cares about whether anybody knows who he is 100 years from now. I think what Blackard cares about is he knows that 100 years from now, Adriatica will be there as a village. And so I think the legacy he's looking for in terms of Adriatica is that his spirit will be looking down as people are going, wow, when those guys thought about doing this here in McKinney, how amazing was this? Thank goodness they took the time to figure it out and were the beneficiaries of this great neighborhood. Jeff was always way ahead of his time. Uh, whenever he would build a, uh, you know, develop a property, he was always, he'd pick the right location, but he would be anywhere from five to 10 years ahead of his time. As a visionary and creative person, he brings all the factors together to make this, uh, make this happen. Jeff Blackert is Nobel Prize worthy for not just the place that's being developed, but the impact that it has on this city, on this state, on this country, and particularly years from now, I believe, on the world around us. I think these villages give you an opportunity to bring back those old world values and sense of community where people from different economic situations and backgrounds can come together and live together in harmony. That sense of connection really creates psychological value, emotional value, along with economic value. And the visualization of village can indeed change the concept of people. And people can change. Certain things are, are done by design. Well, let's redesign it. Will we ever be in a position where everybody gets along? No. But we can put ourselves in a position where people are more accepting. That's what I teach my children. That's what I try to teach the people that I work with. You don't have to always like it and you don't always have to get along. But I think if you have a mutual respect for somebody, then you will be more accepting. We're all human. We're all people and 
we got to make the most of this crazy place while we're here so you know we might as well get to learn to love one another you know i mean it's just that's life at the end of the day when you're driving home whether you have a lot of money or a little money you don't have problems with money or you have stresses with money that's just going to come and go in all of our lives but the relationships are the things that can't be replenished if you walk into adriatica certainly you're going to think it's beautiful but that's not the point that's not the success of adriatica the moment I knew Adriatica was successful is when I was in the harbor eating lunch and looked over and saw the richest man in the village talking to the busboy at lunch. And then later, I saw both of them together in the village just walking along and talking. And I saw the transfer of wisdom, which is the key to what a village is. Adriatica started the beginning of a movement. It's the first of its kind anywhere in the world. And what it's really going to do is bring us all back together again as family that all depends on each other and cares about each other. It's all the things a real village really is.